Rob, I don't really know how to tell you this. This episode contains some strong language. Oh, some zingers, some zing zing zongs. Some absolute zinger ding lingers. Slapper doodle ding dongs. Okay. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll make sure to alert mom, my nanny. June 1997, Waterloo Station, London. Jonathan looks out over the lights of London reflected in the Thames as he rushes across Waterloo Bridge. It's 4 a.m. The night sky is beginning to turn twilight. It's quiet. The odd taxi passes, a few drunk revelers head home. Jonathan pulls his baseball cap down as a couple of girls stumble past him. Guilty as charged. That's weird because I would have been what? 11. (laughs) Well, you started early. He hurries up the stone steps of Waterloo Station and ducks inside under the Victory Arch. To his relief, the entrance hall is near empty, and there's no sign of police. He glances at the giant clock on the wall. He's cutting it fine. An announcement through a tinny speaker makes him jump. He regains his composure and checks the board for his train. The 425 Eurostar to Paris. At security, there's a family in front of him. Two parents and a little girl. Jonathan thinks about his daughter, Victoria, who won't yet know that he's gone. But who he has made lie under oath, lest we forget. That's what I call a whoopsie doodle do. He looked in on her fast asleep an hour ago before slipping out into the waiting car. He's about to put his bags onto the security belt when he has a moment of panic. Perhaps he shouldn't do this. The security woman looks impatient, and Jonathan's jolted back to the present. He's got no choice. So the fate of his family really just hangs in the balance of whether somebody in customer services is a little bit shirty. Now, that is a British scandal. <laughs> it's, it's British, whatever it is. <laughs> oh, I've slightly annoyed a functionary. I better leave my family. A functionary? <laughs> he chucks his hold all into the waiting tray but is bumped into by a man behind, knocking his baseball cap to the floor. The man instantly recognizes him, and in a broad Essex accent shouts, Wait a sec, are you that MP bloke? (laughs) Apologies to everyone from or near Essex. The country of Essex. (laughs) Jonathan scrabbles to pick up his hat, but the man's pulling a newspaper out of his coat pocket. He points to the picture of Jonathan under the headline, Disgraced Tory MP found lying in court. Jonathan shakes his head. No, you've got the wrong person. Have you ever done that where somebody said, are you that guy off the telly? And you've gone, nope. Because I've had a mustache for many years, long before this character did, but I'm an American in London, people have asked me if I'm Ted Lasso. (laughs) Right, okay. And what do you lead with answer-wise for that? I tell them to go fuck themselves. (laughs) Jonathan rushes through the scanner under the eyes of the security guard. He's sure he'll be stopped. The guard looks at him suspiciously. Jonathan holds his breath. It doesn't beep. He breathes out, then grabs his bag from the scanner and rushes off to passport control. I don't know about you, but I feel that way every time I go through that process anyway, and I'm not on the run. Yeah, almost no cocaine in my bag. I'm still nervous. (laughs) (laughs) Standing in the queue, Jonathan anxiously taps his fingers against his passport. He can see the train he's due to get on just behind. He's got minutes before it leaves, and the queue is moving at glacial speed. Finally, he gets to the front and shoves his passport under the screen. The woman behind takes it and goes to stamp it, but something makes her stop. She looks at Jonathan and then back at the passport. Sorry, sir. I'll just be a minute. She stands and disappears out the back of the booth. Jonathan can feel people looking at him now. The queue behind him is moving, other people getting their passports stamped and getting onto the train. Jonathan might explode from frustration. Then there's a hand on his shoulder. Mr. Aitken! For a moment, Jonathan doesn't turn around. He has to make a decision. Fight or flight. If he's caught now, the game's up. He thinks about his daughters sleeping at home. His wife, who's been through so much already. The whole life he's built for himself. Perhaps it's time to face the music. From Wondery, I'm Rob Delaney. He is, and I'm Alice Levine. And this is British Scandal.
Whether you're a Sherlock Holmes aficionado or not, you're going to love the latest instalment in Audible's original series, Moriarty The Silent Order. It's a follow-up to last year's smash hit thriller, Moriarty The Devil's Game, and this time, Holmes and his nemesis have to set aside their mutual loathing and work together to defeat a truly evil force, played deliciously by Helen Mirren. Dominic Monaghan and Phil Lamar are also back in their starring roles, and so are the amazing Twists and Turns. We know you're going to love it. Listen now at audible.com slash silent order. There are so many amazing days on the way to your wedding day, and Zola's here for all of them. Like the day you find your perfect venue, the day you almost skip to the mailbox to send your invites, and the day you realize making a budget isn't so scary. Zola has everything you need to plan the wedding you want, like a free website for your guests to RSVP and shop your registry. And those not-so-amazing days? Zola's here for those, too. Talk to Team Z, Zola's expert wedding advisors. Or join the Zola community, full of other engaged couples who know exactly what you're going through. From getting engaged to getting married, Zola is here for all the days along the way. Start planning at Zola.com. That's Z-O-L-A dot com. So, Rob, in the last episode, we saw Jonathan get one step closer to his dream job, while at the same time, a journalist started uncovering bits of Jonathan's rather unseemly past. I mean, is it so unseemly? I mean, we're talking accepting bribes from senior Saudi government officials, procuring some friendly female companionship for visiting dignitaries. It's not so bad, is it? Actually, when you put it like that, obviously all of that is legit. (laughs) But when you're making your wife and your daughter your accomplices, that doesn't sound as okay. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about a guy who one moment is being tapped to potentially be the next PM, and then the next moment he's begging his daughter to perjure herself (laughs) on his behalf over a plate of lasagna. Not chic. No. And we're at a kind of threshold now, because previously... It feels like he's been the only one at risk. He's the only one in the firing line. But we're going to go one step further. What we've learned here is that Aitken is willing to throw a figurative nail bomb into the kitchen where his wife and daughter are washing dishes to get out of trouble. Yeah, all bets are off. This guy is family first, and I don't mean that in a good way. (laughs) This is episode three, Face the Music. One month earlier, Lord North Street, London. Jonathan perches on the edge of his daughter's bed. In his hand, he grips the witness statement he's written for her. He takes in her teenage signature. It's identical to the cursive script on the Britney Spears poster above her bed. And if they ask why Granny was with you, what will you say? He watches as she peers through the curtain at the crowd of journalists below. He hears one of them shout, Give us a smile, sweetheart. He goes over and slams the window shut, glances at the clock. He and Victoria have to leave for court in 20 minutes. And they're doing this coaching now. (laughs) This is wild. Victoria slumps into a pink and green bean bag. You'll say that Granny was coming to see your new boarding school, okay? Victoria looks up. I don't want to do this. Jonathan tries to hide his impatience. He shifts from foot to foot. But Victoria is now wringing her hands, her bottom lip trembling. In her pajamas, she looks far younger than her 16 years. 16 years. I was with him all the way until this moment. (laughs) He isn't sure what to say. All he knows is that he must persuade Victoria to take the stand. Otherwise, his life as he knows it is over. I know, darling, but it's going to help. I said no. She rushes from the room, slamming the door as she goes. Jonathan curses and chases Victoria across the landing to the bathroom. She's locked the door. Sweetheart, please. He can hear her sobbing. You just need to say Granny was in Switzerland, and that's who I was on the phone to that day. Because Mummy was in Paris paying my bill. Quite a few ingredients in his lie salad. I can barely eat the whole thing. Let alone remember it. (laughs) (laughs) It's hard to stomach, isn't it? (laughs) Darling, I know you don't want to be responsible for me going to prison. He knows it's a low blow. She gingerly opens the door. I want to help you, Daddy. I do, but I don't want to get into trouble. Jonathan glances at his watch. Just over ten minutes. They can still make it. Would Daddy let you get into trouble? He fixes her with a smile until she nods. 
Now, go and get dressed. And I won't get in trouble? Jonathan forces his face into what he hopes is a reassuring expression. Uh, listeners, if you're not already wearing one, please put on a nappy for the next thing Jonathan says. I swear on mummy's life you won't get into trouble. Oh, ho, ho, ho. bloody hell. Listeners, Alice has just vomited. And I'm glad you got me that nappy. A few minutes later, Geneva Airport, Switzerland. David Lee watches snow-capped mountains appear against the blue sky as his taxi races towards the hillside village of Villar. Aitken's due back in court this afternoon with his daughter in tow, and the Guardian is on the brink of financial ruin. David only has four hours to prove that Lolicia was in Switzerland when Aitken says she was in Paris. He's been trying to contact the hotel that Alicia stayed at four years ago for months, but has been stonewalled. So now he's flown himself out. Okay, so just to be clear, what actually happened is Lalicia was in Switzerland and Jonathan was in Paris staying at the Ritz, which was paid for by a Saudi businessman. But Jonathan wants us all to believe that his wife paid the Ritz bill in Paris, not the Saudi businessman, and he only rang the Swiss hotel because his mother-in-law and Victoria were staying there, not his wife, because his wife was in Paris. And so David, the journalist, has gone on an odyssey to Switzerland to prove that, in fact, Lalicia was in Switzerland, not in Paris. Right. (laughs) Now, and the reason that the court will ultimately accept this is because no one believes that someone would call their mother-in-law in a foreign country just to say hello. He climbs out of his taxi and takes in the heady scent of pine cones in the air. He makes his way up the long path to the hotel, running through his plan of attack. But as he turns the corner, he is greeted by an unexpected sight. To his horror, the hotel is completely boarded up. He checks the address in disbelief, drops to the curb, burying his face in his hands. A few minutes later, he slumps onto a bar stool and orders a pint, defeated. He'll spend the next few hours getting drunk. But as he hands some coins over, his ears prick up. As they sealed it tight, even boarded the windows. The barman and a local are discussing the hotel. David leans over. Do you know who owns that place? The local turns around. It used to be me, but it's the banks now. This is highly convenient. I'll say. David sees an opportunity. I don't suppose you still have the keys. A few minutes later, David is being led down a set of stone steps to the hotel's basement. His eyes adjust to the darkness. It's vast. There are hundreds of boxes spread haphazardly across the concrete floor. Bloody mess. Damp got a lot of it. David's heart sinks. He'll never get through it all. A few hours later, he hears the horn of his taxi outside. He can't risk missing his flight. The Guardian won't thank him for forking out for another one. Not when he's coming back empty-handed. He kicks out at a stack of boxes in frustration and they crash to the floor. The contents spill across the concrete. He picks up his coat, too angry to clean up. As he's stepping over the mess, heading to the door, he spots a date at the top of a page. 1993. Oh, baby. The magic number. He looks at it in disbelief. Picks it up. Then another. They're all from 1993. His heart quickens. He kneels among the pages and searches frantically. Name after name of who stayed in 1993. He finally gets to September. And there it is, in black and white. Exactly what he's been looking for. A single room. One guest. Lolicia Aitken. No! Come on! (laughs) David punches the air. He can hardly believe it. This place is Lolicia, and only Lolicia, in Switzerland at the time Aitken says she was in Paris paying the bill. There's no mention of his mother-in-law. No mention of Victoria. This is a literal, not literal, smoking gun. It's also a literal, not literal, needle in a haystack. David dashes upstairs to the dusty reception. He grabs an old phone and, to his relief, hears a dial tone. It finally feels like the tide is turning. He dials the number for the Guardian barrister, George Carmen. I've got him. There's a pause, then Carmen replies. Well, it won't be worth anything unless you can get here with that document. 
David glances at his watch, the taxi waiting outside, the sunlight fading on the mountains. He needs to get back to London in time, because if he can't, the Guardian and his career is finished. You don't think this is actually real, where people run into courtrooms with the evidence, that it's that tight? But it is! It's so exciting! Thank you, David! May 1997. The High Court, London. Victoria peers out of the car's window, catches a glimpse of her own startled expression reflected in the glass, then recoils as the bulbous, sweaty face of a journalist appears on the other side. Victoria, are you going to save your dad's court case? Suddenly, he's wrenched away. Her dad's grinning face reappears. Ready? Victoria tells herself she can do this, that for her dad, she'll do anything. She steps out into the furore. She feels herself being pushed forward, but as she moves deeper into the courtroom, her legs start to freeze. Jonathan whispers in her ear, Darling, what are you doing? She can't remember the words of the statement she signed, the story they talked through this morning. Her mind's racing. She feels like a human shield. Her dad takes hold of her firmly by the shoulders. Victoria, don't let me down now. She can feel the journalist's eyes and cameras on her. She doesn't want to go through with this, but she can't create a scene. She forces herself forward. Inside the court, she watches her witness statement being passed around. They all glance at her as they read it. Finally, the judge nods. Are you ready to question the witness, Mr. Carmen? Carmen nods, and the judge signals for Victoria to come up to the witness box. She walks slowly through the court, her hands shaking. She catches her dad's eye, and he nods at her. She reaches the box and puts a hand on the cold oak veneer to steady herself. Please repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Victoria looks at her dad again, at her mom, at the gallery. She can hear her own breathing. She steadies herself. Victoria looks up in shock as a murmur trickles through the courtroom. A large, square-jawed man stumbles in. He's breathless and bent double. Victoria sees he's holding an envelope. She watches in confusion as he approaches the bench and hands the envelope to the judge. Victoria looks at her dad. It could just be the judge's birthday. It's simply a gift voucher to Nando's. Victoria looks at her dad, all color drained from his face. The judge fixes her with a cold look. She panics. Is there something wrong with her witness statement? Perhaps one of Miss Aitken's parents should step forward, please. Moments later, the High Court, London. Jonathan watches as Lalicia guides a trembling Victoria away. He feels anger rise in his chest. How dare David Lee interrupt his daughter? Interrupt his defense? He steps forward. This is outrageous. It isn't court protocol. I would argue that Jonathan Aitken hasn't necessarily respected the sanctity of the court to this point. Jonathan stares at the judge. I demand this man be removed. Immediately. The judge looks back at him nonplussed. Mr. Aitken, I think it's best we hold proceedings today. I still don't know what the bloody issue is. He reaches out and snatches the document from David's hand. A wave of nausea hits him as he reads its contents. He can feel the court's eyes on him as Lee's wretched document is passed around. Jonathan's mind races. He must be able to charm his way out of this. He must be able to find an angle. But right now, he can't even remember the damn lies he's already told the court. He feels his lawyer's hand on his shoulder. Jonathan, I think it's best we review our options. No, we can fight. We must fight! Later that night, Jonathan paces his study. He's lied to the court under oath. He's likely to go to jail. He can't bear to think of the repercussions for his family. Lalicia. Victoria. He crosses the corridor and peeks into Victoria's bedroom. He's thankful that she's finally asleep. It was only this morning that he promised her that everything would be okay. 
He gently takes the copy of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone from her hand, pulls her duvet up. He wishes he could step into some magic alternate reality. Instead, he's due back in court tomorrow morning. He's meeting his legal team at 7 a.m. He pads downstairs to make himself a coffee, opens the back door to let in a breeze. He steps outside and feels immediately revived. He eyes the door at the end of the garden. It leads onto a quiet side street. Okay, why is that relevant? Mm. He was once tipped to be the next prime minister. The golden boy. The only Tory MP without enemies. And now all he can think about is disappearing. Would it really be so difficult to just vanish? He knows he's run out of rope. Perhaps it is time to run, after all. For whatever you're into, Amazon Prime offers a range of services like Prime Video, Amazon Prime Music, and Prime Fast Free Shipping. I've been using Prime Video to watch some of my favorite uh, rock and roll documentaries. And of course, I use Prime for shopping for all kinds of things. I've got a pretty gnarly sneaker habit, so Prime comes in handy there. This is just one example of many ways that Prime can make life a little richer from shopping to streaming to saving. It's on Prime. Visit Amazon.com slash Prime to get more out of whatever you are into. The stress and crowds of holiday shopping can put a damper on your holiday spirit, and you don't always find all the perfect gifts you're looking for. The Virginia Lottery's games make easy and tremendously fun gifts for all the adults in your life, even you. Celebrate the season of gifting with Virginia Lottery Scratchers and online instant games. For more info, visit valottery.com slash holiday. January 1998, Lord North Street, London. Lolicia takes the red wig and places it on Victoria's head. She watches as her daughter admires herself in the mirror. Fabulous, darling. Lolicia and Victoria laugh as Victoria strikes a series of poses. She ties a blue headscarf under Victoria's chin, places a pair of sunglasses on her nose. Lolicia can't help but feel a jolt of sadness that this outfit isn't for a party. She peers out the window, spots the huddle of journalists smoking outside. Since Jonathan disappeared, it's been hell. Last week, she received a bill from The Guardian demanding Jonathan cover their legal fees. It was for 2.4 million pounds. Lolicia wants nothing more than a divorce, but right now she has no idea where he is. Imagine wanting to really divorce somebody, but the only thing holding you back is not knowing their whereabouts. <laughs> I think if you wait a few years, you can just have them declared dead. Oh, great. Okay, fine. Yeah, so there's an easy fix. You sound like you're speaking from experience. I'm not. <laughs> Victoria is being taunted at school. She's been cast aside by her friends. Journalists wait outside their house night and day. Lolicia grabs Victoria's hand. Ready? Lolicia drags Victoria down the steps and across the street before the journalists can realize they've been tricked. She glances over her shoulder as she hails a taxi, sees the journalist turn, a curious expression on his face. Before he can register what's happening, Lolicia pushes Victoria into the car and speeds away. As they catch their breath, they look at each other and grin. A few hours later, they skip up the front steps, laden with shopping bags. Lolicia is proud of her daughter's fortitude. Although the past few months have been tough, they have never felt closer. She engulfs her in a tight hug, and to her surprise, Victoria responds. It seems that life really is easier without Jonathan in the picture. Come on, then. Let's have the full fashion show. Victoria heads upstairs to try on her new clothes. Lolicia drops her own bags in the hallway and mindlessly thumbs the day's post. She throws the post on the side table and picks up the phone. Uh, I'd like to speak to uh, Victoria Aitken, please. Lolicia feels a chill run down her spine. She will not let journalists call and harass her daughter. Enough is enough. She's about to spit her reply in the receiver when she hears, It's Detective Superintendent Jeff Hunt of the Organized Crime Group. I'd like to question Victoria in connection with allegations of conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. Lilicia feels her blood turn cold. She thought it was just Jonathan that the police wanted to question. I'm not sure this is my color. Lilicia looks up in surprise as Victoria appears in one of her new dresses. 
She feels a tightening in her chest. God, it's not that bad, is it? Lolicia feels the room spin on its axis. Mom, are you okay? Lolicia puts a hand against the wall to steady herself. She hears herself stutter. I'm afraid she's not home. I'll be sure to let her know you called. She kills the line as Victoria comes to her side. Lolicia squeezes her tightly. She refuses to let her beautiful daughter take the hit for her wicked father's actions. This has to stop. She's going to track him down. It's time Jonathan comes home. March 1998, Lord North Street, London. Jonathan twists the key in the lock, curses as it sticks for a third time, for fuck's sake. He struggles under the bags of shopping in his arms. A lone journalist methodically snaps away behind him, flashes illuminating the porch. No less you left you on the doorstep, mate. Jonathan has no choice but to ring the doorbell. He just hopes Lalicia is actually in. She demanded he come home after the police started harassing Victoria. She could have told him she'd changed the blasted locks. Yeah, he's definitely the victim in this situation. Finally, the door opens. He relaxes. Until he realizes Lalicia has put the door chain on. He whispers, Christ, Lalicia, there's a journo out here. Lalicia is entirely unperturbed. Have you spoken with the police? He only arrived back in the UK this morning. He looks her in the eye and promises. I had a delay, so I phoned ahead. I'm going first thing in the morning. It's not the whole truth. He wants to talk to Victoria first. He's spoken to his lawyer, and he thinks he might be in with a fighting chance. As an MP with a clean record and an outstanding history of public service, his lawyers told him the charges might even be dropped, as long as he, and Victoria, fully cooperate. Inside, he finds Victoria lying across an armchair reading Tattler. He's hit with a wave of emotion as he realizes how much he's missed his family. Hello, darling. Victoria doesn't take her eyes off the page. Hi, Jonathan. Ooh, that is... That's, Oof. I mean, I do call my dad by his first name, but that's at his request. He's, Understood. He's tried to create that emotional distance, but that is weaponized use of the old first name, isn't it? He laughs uncomfortably and glances at Lelicia. What? Did you expect a hug? Twenty minutes later, Jonathan tries to make small talk over dinner. So, how's school? Victoria snaps back. Do you mean apart from the police wanting to question me about the witness statement that you wrote? Jonathan puts down his knife and fork. Look, I'm going to do all I can to make it up to you both. He shuffles his chair forward, sensing an opening. So, the police have contacted you at school? Victoria eyes him suspiciously. He feels Lolicia shift at his side. I've spoken to my solicitor. Jonathan isn't sure how to put this. And he has advised that it is within all our interests as a family that we all cooperate fully with the police. He sits back and braces for a fight. But instead, to his alarm, Victoria just stares back at him, stunned. He watches as she wipes a tear from her eye, then correct her posture, take a breath, and look him dead in the eye. Only if you promise to never talk to me again. Jonathan looks at her askance. Victoria. He watches as she quietly stands, folds her napkin, and leaves the table. He hears Lalicia spit at his side. It's over, Jonathan. Our family is over. He stares at the kitchen counter. He's already lost his career. He refuses to lose his family. He's going to do what he should have done months ago. It's time to take responsibility and finally protect his daughter. Christmas Eve, 1998. Met Police Station, London. That's so weird. That's what I'm doing this Christmas. Oh, terrific. You know how to party. Jonathan flinches as he's hustled along a small corridor. A drunk woman throws up beside him. At the end of the corridor sit two men with blood on their knuckles. Nice to spend it together. A few minutes later, Jonathan finds himself sitting under a blinding fluorescent strip light in an interview room. He catches his reflection in a two-way mirror. His hair's a mess. He's got bags under his eyes and a five o'clock shadow. He has to look away. The detective starts the tape. Mr. Aitken, given your daughter's cooperation, you've suggested you'd be open to a plea deal. Jonathan nods. 
If you admit to perjury and pervert in the course of justice, Victoria will be released without charge. Jonathan takes a deep breath, closes his eyes. This is it. The lying. The deception. It all ends now. Is this like giving up cigarettes? Is it like, but I'll just do one more and then I'll really give up. But Jonathan's solicitor bursts in, breathing laboriously. What the hell is going on in here? Jonathan's head whips round, startled by the intrusion. Jonathan, don't say another word. Why on earth are you speaking to them without me here? Jonathan's mouth gapes as his solicitor rounds on the police officer. I need some time with my client. Alone. Jonathan watches as the detective reluctantly rises and leaves. Once the door closes, Jonathan hangs his head in shame. I can't do this to Lelissi and Victoria anymore. I'm going to tell them the truth. Jonathan, use your brain. You could face five years inside for this. Jonathan feels his old panic return. Five years? I love how little he's thought this through. He's like, no, I've got to go clean. I've got to tell the girl. Sorry, five years. Okay, um, then I've probably got quite a good lie to cover this. Everything in his body is telling him to take his solicitor's advice. Jonathan squirms under the intensity of his gaze. Promise me you'll stick to what we agreed. Jonathan looks anywhere but his lawyer's face. Catches sight of himself again in the mirror. He thinks of Victoria, her youth, her innocence. He can't risk her being called in for questioning again, or worse. She has a life to live. He knows he only has one choice. Bring the police officer back in. His solicitor blinks at him, confused. Don't do this, Jonathan. Jonathan twists towards the door, handcuffs biting his wrists. I'm ready to confess. As his lawyer shakes his head and leaves the room, he's replaced by the detective, who restarts the tape. All right, Mr. Aitken, let's go from the top. 8th of June, 1999. Lord North Street, London. Jonathan stands in the hall, struggling with his cufflinks. You need a tie. How about that one I bought you for your birthday? Lolicia goes upstairs to find it. Things have been better between them since he stepped up for Victoria. More like the old days. It's a small relief given everything that's going on. Today is his sentencing. His lawyers are optimistic about a suspended sentence, which would mean he could finally put this whole sordid business behind him. Work on his relationship with Lolicia. And rebuild trust with the rest of the family. An hour later, Jonathan stands in the dock. The judge enters. Jonathan gives him his best smile, but the judge doesn't even look at him. Jonathan grips the side of the bench as the room falls silent. Mr. Aitken, you're charged with perjury and perverting the course of justice. I understand you pled guilty and that it was almost entirely to save your daughter from being charged. Jonathan looks at the floor. He hopes the judge will reward his good intentions. It is mind-blowing that even at this point, he's placing so much weight on the fact that he eventually saw the error of his ways. He's kind of discounted all of his bad behaviour. How old was your daughter at the time that the false witness statement was drafted? She was 16, sir. The judge nods. It is a very grave feature of this case that you chose to involve your daughter and wife in the crime. Jonathan looks up in horror. For nearly four years, you wove a web of deceit in which you entangled yourself and from which there was no way out unless you were prepared to come clean and tell the truth. Unfortunately, you were not. Jonathan's breath catches in his throat. He feels the full force of the last four years catching up with him. For a terrible moment, he thinks he might cry in front of the judge, his legal team, and the public gallery. Jonathan Aitken, I am sentencing you to 18 months in prison. The press gallery explodes. Jonathan struggles to breathe. He was expecting a suspended sentence. He is escorted out of the courtroom and into a waiting police van. A guard places cuffs on his wrists and pushes him into the back of the van before slamming the door shut, leaving Jonathan in darkness. To be honest with you, I also thought he was going to get a suspended sentence. These guys always get away with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think you can get five years, 18 months doesn't sound so bad. That's true. It's only, what, two pregnancies? The mission. 
Get your holiday gifts on time or your money back. The answer? Etsy. Whether you want home pieces like serveware and throw pillows or style items like handbags and knits, Etsy has it. New to Etsy? Use code HOLIDAY10 for 10% off your first purchase. Maximum discount value of $50. Expires December 31st, 2023. Terms at Etsy.com slash terms. To claim refund, see requirements and exclusions at Etsy.com slash legal slash buyers. That night, Belmarsh Prison, London. Jonathan takes in the tiny cell, the barred window, the open toilet in the corner, and the graffiti-scrawled wall. He collapses onto the hard metal bed as a wave of exhaustion hits him. He just needs to sleep. And that's when the banging starts, echoing down the corridor. Bacon's in C-24! And a roar of excitement goes up. We're gonna fuck you up, Aiken! It's nice to meet the constituents. <laughs> Jonathan pulls the blanket over his body. He isn't sure if he's shaking from cold or fear. He lies awake all night. The next morning, Jonathan stands in the middle of the cell, ready for the door to be unlocked. He's not slept a minute. His stomach churns. The guard pushes his door open. Come on, out with you. Jonathan doesn't move. I might just stay here, if that's okay with you. <laughs> <laughs> we are all Aitken uh, in this moment. <laughs> the guard looks annoyed, like he hasn't got time for this. Sit yourself. To Jonathan's relief, the guard goes. He sits down on the bed, pulls out a piece of paper to write to Victoria. He wants her to know how sorry he is and how hard he's going to work to put things right with her. He finally starts to lose himself when he becomes aware of a dark presence in the doorway. Aitken? Jonathan feels his hands trembling. He places the pen down, tries to steady his hands. He's never had a fight in his life. Then he second guesses himself and decides to pick up the pen. What are you writing? Jonathan steadies himself. A letter. Jonathan has never felt more alert as the man takes a few steps into his cell. He wants to cry out, but worries it will only make what's to come worse. Instead, he looks away, succumbing to his fate. Don't suppose you'd write a letter for me, would you? Jonathan starts. He glances up at the prisoner, taken aback. A letter? He feels like a bumbling fool as the prisoner looks at him, bemused. My landlord's kicking my girlfriend out. She's 35 weeks pregnant and got nowhere else to go. Well, I'm sure we could make your case to him. Half an hour later, the man holds the letter. You've got nice handwriting. In a matter of hours, there's a queue of men with paper and pens outside C-24. Jonathan writes letter after letter to girlfriends, moms, and brothers. Instead of jeering and banging, the cell is filled with excited chatter. Jonathan smiles, elated. He's found something important, his key to survival. Maybe, just maybe, he will get through this. So that's pretty fucking cool, honestly. I mean, that, like, finally, because he's such an asshole, he literally has to be put in a cell and then forced through fear to be useful. Then when he does it, he's like, oh, wait a minute, it does feel nice to help people. Although, I'm with you, it is altruistic on one level, but it's also just so he's okay in prison. Um... Yeah, yeah, I mean, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> I think that's a great point, though. Yeah, this may be a good way for me to get some work done. <laughs> some things I've been putting off. How about 18 months, and we'll give you a year if you get your work done? Ooh, now that would really motivate me. Like, I don't want to go to prison for 18 months, but if you could maybe put me in a cage just for, like, three weeks or something, as long as it had a little mattress in it, it doesn't even have to smell good. Because when I'm not in jail, I want to help my family. I can't help it. I have a biological imperative. But if you put me in a cage, oh, well, you know, they'd have to fend for themselves. So you'd get so much done, you wouldn't, you'd just have a sort of holiday from your responsibilities. Yeah, yeah, I'd like that. Okay, let me see what I can do. Um, <laughs> what size cage? I'm a big boy. Big uh, men's XL cage. <laughs> <laughs> Nineteen years later, Old Bailey, London. Thirty-eight-year-old Victoria bites her bottom lip as she enters the room and takes in the big glass dome ceiling. 
The last time she was here was as a false witness, and she feels as sick today as she did then. Particularly when she spots the person that put her there across the room. She watches her dad from afar, surrounded by people. She hasn't seen him much since his release from prison. She's struck by his graying hair, his outfit. He's already dressed in white robes and certainly looks the part. Even for a family with odd sartorial instincts, (laughs) what is going on? (laughs) Thou shalt not bear false witness. Eh? Her father had written to her about finding Christianity while studying in prison. Sorry, so he's a man of the cloth now? I mean, he's not swimming in options. (laughs) At first she hadn't wanted to attend his ordination, but curiosity got the better of her. She wants to know if he's really changed. But seeing him now, she feels a sudden need to get away from his orbit. She can't handle all these people fawning over him like he's some kind of hero. She steps out into the bright sunshine of central London and takes a deep breath, pulls out her phone and checks the time of the next train home. She's got enough time to walk to try and untie the knot in her stomach. Victoria! She spins around and there he is, rushing down the steps towards her. I'm so glad you could come. He races to her, holding out his arms for a hug, but she steps back. He sees her discomfort. There's an awkward pause. Victoria doesn't know where to look. I'm sorry, I I shouldn't have come. She goes to leave. Victoria, please, hear me out. She turns back and sees the desperation in his eyes. He looks so much older than the strong, untouchable man she used to think he was when she was a kid. I don't know why I did it. Pride, perhaps, vanity. And I'm sure this will mean very little to you. But I need you to know that I've changed. Victoria looks at the floor. She's been so desperate to hear this for years. But now she doesn't know if she can believe it. That man who manipulated you? That's not who I am anymore. I will spend the rest of my life repenting for his crimes. Victoria studies him. I would love the opportunity to show you. Then the doors of the Old Bailey open and people pile out, heading to St. Paul's Cathedral. Someone calls to her dad and he turns, clearly torn. Your fans await. He looks back at her. You could come. Victoria thinks about it for a moment, but shakes her head. He looks crushed. She adds, I hope it goes well. And she means it. She watches her dad join the religious revelers and then heads off down the road. Back to her life where no one knows her as the daughter of disgraced Tory MP, Jonathan Aitken. Lolicia Aitken divorced Jonathan in 1998, after it was revealed he had fathered a daughter during a relationship with the wife of a Saudi arms dealer. That'll do it. He's the gift that keeps on giving. In 2002, the Daily Telegraph reported she had flown back to London, despite the risk of arrest, to attend Jonathan's 60th birthday party. It is reported that she splits her time between Monte Carlo, Paris, New York, and Zurich. After writing his book about Aitken called The Liar, David Lee worked on some of the biggest stories of the past few decades. In 2010, he was a member of the team which helped break the WikiLeaks story. He retired from journalism in 2013. Victoria Aitken is now an actress and singer. She has written songs called I Love the DJ and I'll Be Your Bitch. What's your third favorite Victoria Aitken track? Uh, DJ, bitch, um, beep, beep, car time. I don't know (laughs) what. (laughs) Since being ordained in 2018, Jonathan Aitken has been a minister at St. Matthew's Church, Westminster, and a chaplain at Pentonville Prison. He is an active campaigner for criminal justice issues, particularly the rehabilitation for prisoners. In a recent interview with Good Morning Britain, Aitken reflected, The fire of a scandal burns you, but those burns need not leave permanent scars. Life does go on. There is life after a scandal. Or as we say on this show, Rob, there's always a podcast after the scandal. Before we go, Rob Delaney, we should probably tell people about the very exciting interview we've got to round off the series. Oh, yeah. Hey, what if I told you we were speaking to one of the main characters in this sordid tale? Oh, my God. Did we actually get Jonathan Aitken? Uh, No, we we didn't. But I'll tell you what, I'll give you a clue. It's one of my favorites. Oh, my God. 
It's Val, right? Our long-suffering friend. And actually, I've got loads of questions to ask her. And I'm just so pleased because sometimes, if I'm completely honest, there are moments in British Scandal where our female characters, they get neglected. You know, we kind of don't give them a platform to tell their own oh, story. no, God, no, 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 no. It's a man. Uh, a good man at that. A man who will stop at nothing to uncover the truth. And we will be speaking to the investigative titan, breaker of stories, destroyer of Aitken, David Lee. Okay, but this is the last man and I mean it. <laughs> Hello, Prime members. You can listen to British Scandal ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey. This is the third episode in our series, The Aitken Affair. A quick note about our dialogue. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said or where. It's a dramatisation inspired by historical events. If you'd like to know more about this story, you can read Pride and Perjury by Jonathan Aitken and The Liar, The Fall of Jonathan Aitken by David Lee, David Pallister and Luke Harding. I'm Alice Levine. And I'm Rob Delaney. British Scandal is a production of Wondery and Samizdat Audio. Jess Green wrote this episode... Additional writing by Alice Levine and Rob Delaney. Our sound design is by Rich Evans. Script editing by James Magniak. This episode was produced by Millie Chu. Our associate producer is Francesca Gelardi Quadrio Corsio. Our senior producer is Joe Sykes. Our series producer is Theodora Leloudis for Wondery. Our executive producers are Rich Knight, Jessica Radburn and Marshall Louie for Wondery. This episode is brought to you by Vital Farms. No matter how you like your eggs, scrambled, over easy, or sunny side up, the people at Vital Farms believe in one thing, keeping it bull free. That's why their pasture-raised eggs come from hens who each have over 108 square feet of space to roam and forage all year round. So you can spend less time questioning your food and more time enjoying it. Look for the black Vital Farms carton in your grocery store and learn more at vitalfarms.com. Vital Farms, keeping it bull free.